Hello there. I am back to read you some more of, in their own words, Helen Keller by George Sullivan. So as you may remember, we left off chapter eight with Helen just graduated college from Radcliffe, which is back then was a part of Harvard. So it's amazing. And she graduated with honors. Um, and then she was also hired uh, to write articles about her life and her overcoming her disabilities. So let's see how that how that works out for her. Chapter nine, writer, speaker, traveler. Our chief happiness is that we have a real home of our own. It is old fashioned, roomy and cheerful. I never had a room for my books before. This is how Helen described the farmhouse that she and Annie purchased in Rentham, Massachusetts, south of Boston. They moved in just before Helen graduated from Radcliffe. Helen was 24 years old now. She knew she must decide what she would do with the rest of her life. She was unsure what profession to choose. One thing was certain, however. She knew that she would, that she would devote her life to those who suffer from the loss of sight. Helen kept busy writing. She wrote one magazine article after another. Her articles were about people who were blind and the special problems they faced. John Macy often visited Helen and Annie in the Rentham home. He helped Helen with her writing. Annie's eyesight continued to get worse, but John was always there to help. I do not know what we should do with I do not know what we would should do without John, Helen said in a letter to a friend. John was becoming more and more important in the lives of Helen and Annie. Helen sensed that Annie and John were falling in love. Helen was right. John asked Annie to marry him. Annie said no. She explained that she could never let anyone come between her and Helen. John promised her that it, Helen would come first. He said that Helen's life would be just as before. Even that promise was not enough for Annie. She told John that he must get Helen to approve. John spoke to Helen in the study of their rent home, in the study of their rent ham home. He told her that he had asked Annie to marry him. Do you love her? Helen asked, tapping the words into John's hand. With a quick hand signal, John said yes. Does she love you? Another hand signal. Another yes. Then marry her, of course, Helen declared. And here is a picture of Anne Sullivan reading over John's shoulder with Helen. John and Annie were married in 1905. The couple settled down in the Rentham house with Helen. Helen continued to write. John assisted her. With his help, Helen finished another book titled The World I Live In. The book was published in 1908. The book was a big success. In it, Helen explained how she used her sense of touch to appreciate the delicate shapes of flowers, the noble forms of trees, and the range of mighty winds. Vibrations were very important in Helen's life. I derive much knowledge of everyday matters from the jars and jolts which are to be felt everywhere in the house. It is impossible to mistake a child's patter for the tread of a grown person. I know when one kneels, kicks, shakes something, sits down, or gets up. Knowing that the public was curious about her world, Helen decided to try, to try giving lectures. She first took special lessons to strengthen her vocal cords. Otherwise, she knew she would not be able to be heard in a lecture hall. And this shows a picture of Helen in nature. It's how she learned about nature was by touching it. And again, this is how she was able to enjoy music by feeling the vibrations. So there she's feeling the vibrations of the piano keys. Helen faced her first audience in Montclair, New Jersey. Hey, New Jersey. In 1913, her lecture was titled, The Heart and the Hand in the Right Use of Our Senses. 
Annie was at her side. As she began to speak, Helen felt the grip of panic, but she kept going. Stage fright finally overcame her. She left the stage in tears. Helen thought she had been a dismal failure. She was wrong. The audience loved her performance. Cheers and applause rang out. In time, Helen became one of America's most popular speakers. She and Annie developed a plan for their appearances. Annie would speak first, explaining the methods that she had used in teaching Helen to read, write, and communicate. Then she would introduce Helen. They would demonstrate how Helen was able to read lips with her fingers. Then Helen spoke directly to the audience. Annie would repeat each sentence. Helen once spoke at a conference of doctors at the Harvard Medical School. Afterward, a reporter asked her whether she knew that she had spoken before a large crowd. I should say I did, Helen replied. I could feel them and smell them. How did you feel them? The reporter asked. By any number of vibrations through the air and through the floor, from the moving of feet or the scraping of chairs, and by the warmth when there were, are people around. So Helen really relied on her senses in order to communicate and sense her surroundings. How can you tell by your sense of smell? There was a doctor's odor, Helen answered. Do you mean to say that doctors have a special odor which you can recognize? A very decided odor, Helen said. It's partly the smell of ether and partly the smell that lingers from the sick rooms in which they have been. But I could tell many professions from their odor. Which ones? Doctors, painters, sculptors, masons, carpenters, druggists, and cooks. What does the carpenter smell like? And the druggist? The carpenter is always accompanied by the odor of wood. The druggist is saturated with various drugs. And a druggist is like a pharmacist. There's a painter who comes here often, and I could tell the minute he comes anywhere near me. Could you tell my work in that way? The reporter asked. Do you smell any ink? No, a typewriter, I think, Helen said with a grin. Could you really tell that? The reporter asked. Helen laughed. I'm afraid that was a guess, she said. Next year, 1914, Helen, Annie, and Helen's mother set out on a lecture tour that took them to the West Coast. The lectures drew enthusiastic crowds. In 1915, they planned to repeat the tour. Helen wrote to her mother about it. We start for the Middle West the second week in January. So go through Ohio, Indiana, Iowa, Kansas, St. Louis, down to Texas, as far as El Paso, then to Lower California and up to San Francisco and back home through California. It will be most interesting for you, I'm sure. Do come. In preparing for the trip, Helen and Annie hired an assistant. She was 24-year-old Polly Thompson. Newly arrived from Scotland, Polly wanted to settle in the United States. Helen did not know the manual alphabet, or Polly did not know the manual alphabet. She could not read Braille. But she was bright and quick. She soon became valuable as a secretary and household manager. She seems to know what I want without my telling her, Helen said of Polly in a letter to her sister. Later, when Annie became ill, Polly would take over Annie's role as Helen's constant companion. And there's a picture of Polly and Helen. Chapter 10, A Marriage Offer. Throughout her life, Helen did not hesitate to let people know what was on her mind. When World War I broke out in Europe in 1914, Helen had an opinion. She did not want the United States to get involved in the fighting. I look upon the world as my fatherland, she wrote, and every war has, has me for the horror of a family feud. I hold true patriotism to be the brotherhood and mutual service of all men. Public opinion in the United States supported the war, however. Helen's anti-war views caused her popularity to shrink. Few people were interested in hearing her speak. Helen's lecture tour in 1916 was a failure. So because people disagreed with her views, they stopped attending her lectures. When Helen and Annie returned to their home in Rentham, Massachusetts, there was more bad news than 
A doctor had found Annie to be seriously ill. Her illness was made worse by her marriage to John Macy, which had become troubled. Annie and John eventually separated. A doctor ordered Annie to spend time at a health resort. It was decided that Polly would go along to help nurse Annie back to health. Helen invited her mother to come to Renham. There was also a third member of the household. His name was Peter Fagan. He was 29 years old. Helen and Annie had hired Peter as a secretary. Peter taught himself Braille and the manual alphabet. Helen enjoyed the young man's company. He had a good sense of humor. They soon found that they shared the same views on the war and the social issues of the day. One September evening in 1916, while Helen was sitting alone in her study, Peter enter entered the room. For a long time, she wrote, he held my hand in silence. Then he began talking to me tenderly. I was surprised that he cared so much about me. He was full of plans for my happiness. He said if I would marry him, he would always be near to help me in the difficulties of life. The sweetness of being loved enchanted me, Helen wrote. Her hand trembling, she signaled to Peter that she would accept his offer of marriage. Helen was excited. She wanted to tell Annie and her mother right away about the wonderful thing that happened to me. But Peter said they should wait. He knew that Helen's mother did not like him. He felt certain that she would disapprove of the marriage. Let us keep our love secret a little while, Peter said. Your teacher is too ill to be excited just now, and we must tell her first. Helen didn't like the idea of keeping their plan a secret. She wrote, the thought of not sharing my happiness with my mother and Annie little by little destroyed the joy of being loved. The couple moved ahead with their plans. They traveled to Boston together. At the registrar's office, there they sought a marriage license. Then a Boston newspaper reporter found out about the couple's request for a marriage license. The Boston newspapers were soon filled with stories about Helen's romance. Helen's mother was furious. She went to Helen's room. She picked up Helen's hand. Helen knew immediately something was wrong. Here's a picture of Annie Sullivan, Helen, and then this is Helen's mother over here. The papers are full of a dreadful story about you and him, were the words she tapped into Helen's hand. What does it all mean? Tell me. Helen pretended not to know what her mother was talking about. Her mother continued, are you engaged to him? Did you apply for a marriage license? Helen denied everything. At the time, Helen was 36 years old. She was famous throughout the world. But to Mrs. Keller, Helen was simply a daughter who had acted foolishly. Mrs. Keller ordered Peter out of the house. She wouldn't even let him say goodbye to Helen. Then she announced that they would be returning to the family home in Tuscumbia. Peter followed them to Alabama. One night, he showed up on the front porch of the Keller home. Mrs. Keller had him sent away. Peter and Helen eventually realized there would be no marriage. Peter withdrew from Helen's life. Years later, Helen wrote of the romance. The brief love will remain in my life, she said. A little island of joy surrounded by the dark waters. Hmm. That is the end of chapter 10. So poor Helen's mother disapproved of her marriage. I wonder what would have happened if that was not the scenario. What do you think? We'll find out more in the next two chapters.